In this video, I'll show you how to control a vibration motor with an Arduino. Unlike larger motors that you might use to drive something like a wheel or a propeller, these smaller motors typically don't drive a load. Instead, they're used in devices like video game controllers and cell phones to make them vibrate. Let's zoom in and take a look at the motors because there are several different types. This one is called an eccentric rotating mass, or ERM motor, and that is just a fancy way of saying off-center weight. You can see that this weight attached to the motor's shaft is not symmetric, so when it spins, it causes it to wobble around, creating the vibration. This one on the left here is called a pancake or coin vibration motor. It also has an eccentric rotating mass, but it is completely self-contained and sealed. The smaller rotating mass is actually completely inside this motor. So the pancake or coin motors tend to be a little more compact and they don't have any exterior moving parts. They are also a little easier to mount because the bottom is flat and they usually come with an adhesive backing where you can peel off this paper and then stick them onto something. So both types of motors work just fine. These with the external weight may come in a wider variety of sizes, so you could get some bigger ones if you need a slightly, slightly stronger vibration, but these pancake or coin motors, again, can be easier to mount and a little more compact, so they both work, but which one is better is going to depend on your application. One important note about using these motors with an Arduino, since you will usually be prototyping a circuit on a breadboard, is that the wires are typically way too thin and flexible to press into the holes on the breadboard. So to make those connections, you are going to need to either solder if you have a soldering iron available, or if not, use some other tools like needle nose pliers just to twist and crimp the connection from the flexible leads on the motors to some solid jumper wire, which you can then press into the breadboard like you would normally. So that's what I did for the motor you saw earlier in this video. These connections aren't even soldered. I just twisted them together, crimped them with the needle nose pliers, and then wrapped them in electrical tape. Although for a better, more permanent covering, you could use heat shrink tubing instead of the tape, and that's going to secure the connection and hold your wires on a little better. So no matter how you do it, don't waste time trying to press these very thin, flexible wires into the breadboard. Make the connection to that solid core jumper wire, and that will make your connection to the breadboard much more manageable. Finally, it is important to note that even though these motors are very small, they can easily draw over 100 milliamps of current, which you can see on my multimeter screen here. I have this set to measure current in the 200 milliamp range, and that is more than can be provided by the Arduino's digital pins directly. These are only good for about up to 20 milliamps, which is enough to light an LED, but not enough to drive even a very small motor like this. So we are going to go over the details of the circuit in a minute, but you do need another part called a transistor to help power the motor, since you can't drive it directly from the Arduino pins. To look at the circuit and example code, we are going to switch over to Tinkercad Circuits, which is a free online Arduino simulator. You can find a link to a tutorial video about using Tinkercad circuits in our Arduino playlist in the description of this video, and you can also find a link to this circuit which you can copy and edit on your own, again linked in the description of the video. Looking at the circuit, we have a button which I am not going to spend too much time on in this video because we have an earlier video in our tutorial series all about buttons, but very quickly we have one side of that button connected to 5 volts. The other side of the button is connected to ground through an external 10 kilo ohm pull down resistor, and that side of the button is also connected to one of the Arduino's digital pins. So in this configuration with the pull down resistor, the digital input will be low by default when the button is not pressed, and it will go high or 5 volts when the button is pressed. Next, we're going to look at the motor, which again is not just connected directly to one of the Arduino's digital pins because these cannot provide enough current to drive the motor directly. Instead, we have a part called a transistor, which acts sort of like an electronic control valve to control current flowing through the motor from another power source, in this case, the 5 volt supply from the Arduino. This type of transistor is called an N-channel MOSFET. We are not really going to go into detail on what exactly that means or the different types of transistors in this video. We are just going to show you how to use this type because it is the common type you would use to control a motor 
or another high power external load like very bright LEDs when using an Arduino and the I.O. pins cannot provide enough current to drive that load directly. If we zoom in on the MOSFET, we see that it has three pins going from left to right. When looking at it like this, they are called the gate, drain, and source. But of course, we need to have our MOSFET rotated when placed in the breadboard, so each pin is in its own row. If you put it in the breadboard like this, then those three pins will all be short-circuited together since each hole in that breadboard row is electrically connected. So when I have it in the breadboard like this, going from bottom to top, the pins are gate, drain, and source. The gate is the electronic control pin that determines how much current flows through the motor. No current actually flows into the gate pin itself. It just controls the current flowing from an external power supply. So to use a water analogy, you can think of this like turning the handle on a faucet for a sink or a hose, where you're not actually providing any of the water yourself, you're just controlling water flow from some other source. So that gate pin is going to go directly to one of the I.O. pins on the Arduino. And again, we can do that because the gate pin itself is not actually drawing any current. Next up, we have the drain pin, which we are going to connect to the negative lead from the motor. And then finally, we have the source pin, which we are going to connect to ground. We are then going to connect the positive lead from the motor to five volts from the Arduino. Now, what this does is creates a path for current to flow from the five volt supply on the Arduino through the breadboard, through this jumper wire that I have here, through the motor, into the positive wire, out through the negative wire, into the MOSFET's drain pin, out the MOSFET's source pin, and then back to ground. So you notice that nowhere in that loop did I have the Arduino's I.O. pins. All of the power was coming from the Arduino's 5 volt supply and then returning to ground. So no current comes out of this digital pin 8. That is just the control pin going to the MOSFET's gate but it doesn't have that higher current, that 100 milliamps flowing through it, so we are avoiding damaging our Arduino's I.O. pins by just using pin 8 as the control signal. The code to control the motor with the button is very simple. It's actually identical to the code you would use to control an LED with a button. The only difference is in the hardware, where again, an LED could be connected directly to the Arduino's I.O. pins, but for the motor, we need the transistor since it requires more current. So looking at the code, we declare variables for the button pin and the motor pin. We also declare a variable for the button state. In the setup function, we use the pin mode command to set the button pin as an input and the motor pin as an output. I also then initialize serial communication so we can print the status of the motor out to the serial monitor. In the loop function, we use the digital read command to read the button pin and then if the button state is high, we use digital write to turn the motor pin on. We also print out to the serial monitor that the motor is on. Else, if the button is not pressed, so the input state is low, we use digital write to turn the motor pin off, and we are going to print off to the serial monitor. If I run the simulation, we can see that, as we expect, the motor is off when the button is not being pressed. When I click and hold the button down, the motor turns on and Tinkercad simulates that with this little vibrating animation. When I release again, the motor turns off. There are other things you could try here. For example, using the analog write command instead of digital write if you wanted to vary the speed of the motor or the intensity of the vibration. If you do that, you need to make sure you are using one of the PWM or analog write compatible pins indicated by the little squiggly mark on the Arduino. I'm not going to demonstrate that in this video, but we do cover using analog write earlier in our tutorial series. You could also create pulsed or intermittent vibrations by using digital write commands with short delays in between them. So again, when you think of something like your cell phone vibrating, when you get a call, it might not be a continuous vibration, but it might vibrate on and off in an alternating pattern pattern for a certain amount of time. So you could do that by alternating digital write high and low with delays in between. Again, I'm not going to demonstrate that in this video, but you can try it out yourself. The final thing I will talk about here is power. If you are using a single small motor, it is generally okay to power it directly from the 5 volt supply on the Arduino. 
However, if you are using multiple motors or a larger motor, it is generally a good idea to have a separate external power supply since the Arduino might not be able to provide enough current for your motors. So for example, a common external power supply is something like a four by AA battery pack. And you can connect that to the circuit and your breadboard as follows. First, your entire circuit always needs a common ground. So make sure that the ground buses on your breadboard are connected to the ground pin on the Arduino and to the negative wire of your battery pack. However, it is very important to make sure that you do not short circuit different positive voltages together. In this case, we have five volts from the Arduino and we now will have six volts from this four by AA battery pack because each battery is 1.5 volts and we get six volts by combining them in series. So I need to make sure I do not short circuit six volts from the battery pack to five volts from the Arduino. I'm going to do that by deleting this jumper wire here and connecting this power bus on the breadboard to my six volts. So again, my entire circuit does have a common ground. I have this ground wire connecting the ground buses on the opposite sides of the breadboard, but I have isolated my two different positive voltages on the opposite sides of the breadboard. So the button is still operating on the five volt logic level from the Arduino, but my motor is now going to draw its current from this external power supply, so I don't have to worry about whether I am drawing too much current from the Arduino. Make sure you check the voltage rating of your motor when you do this. For example, some of these small motors might only be rated at three volts, not six volts. So when I start the simulation, you can see Tinkercad actually gives a little animation error here to indicate that I'm sending too much current through the motor. But if I drop this down to example, for example, to only two batteries and run the simulation, then it's okay. So again, Tinkercad is just a simulation. It has some parameters for all of the different components in here. When you buy a motor in the real world, you will need to check the specs or the data sheet to see what the actual voltage and current ratings are and choose a power supply accordingly. We hope you found this video useful and that you're now ready to integrate vibration motors into your next Arduino project. For many other Arduino tutorials and cool projects you can do with an Arduino, check out the rest of our YouTube channel. For over a thousand other cool projects you can do in all areas of science and engineering, visit our website, www.sciencebuddies.org.